So I'm going to talk about um, a couple of things, uh, a couple of aspects of software development that may be, or I hope will be, useful for research software um, in this field. And we're going to lead this into an example, a, a coded example, uh, which will take us all the way up to the cost break. Um, but the main things that I'm going to be talking about are unit testing and automated testing generally of software. Um, and test-driven development, and the use of version control software. And these will be illustrated, hopefully, in a nice sort of constructive way um, through the example. Now, let me just firstly explain what these things are. Unit testing is uh, a, simply a way of taking a piece of your software and testing it by writing another little piece of code that calls it and takes a look at what results it produces and tells you if those results are wrong. So, Obviously, there's a limit to what unit testing can do. It's not going to run your entire experiment and tell you whether the results are right or not. But it is a, a way of testing small components of your software. Make sure that, it, firstly, that it's written in a way that makes it actually um, comprehensible and makes it easy for you to call your code and other people to call it. Uh, it allows you to test the individual components to make sure they work correctly individually as far as you can. And so it improves the likelihood that when you put them together into a bigger program, you'll end up with the correct results then. And it also provides a form of regression testing. It ensures that if you, if you have a test in place and then you go and change part of your method so that it works in a quite different way, uh, that your, your tests will ensure that, uh, that, that you don't break it completely so that, the, that the, the basic, your basic assumptions about what your code should do continue to be true. It also provides, this isn't mentioned here, but it also provides a kind of documentation where generally software developers generally in research, research and developers in particular, generally quite bad about documenting their code as opposed to their methods when they write it. And the beauty of writing unit tests is that if somebody else then is looking at your code, they can have a look at what your tests do in order to find out how your code should be called. So it's a, it's a kind of free documentation. Also very useful in the development process, and particularly, in fact, in a research environment where you don't necessarily know how your method is going to work, if you're having difficulty establishing, when you're writing a, a, a method and trying to implement it in software, if you're having difficulty establishing how it's actually going to work, it can be very useful to think about the problem the other way around, to think about it in terms of what the inputs are going to be and what outputs you might expect, and to write a test that, 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 that ensures that you get outputs that you, the, the outputs that you expect for known inputs, and then from there build it up into, into the method. The other thing that we'll be looking at is the use of version control. And this um, version control software is simply software that keeps track of the changes you make to a set of files in a, in a project or in a directory. Uh, version control software just tracks the history of the files, it tracks what you changed and when, which allows you to answer questions like how you get back to the version you had last week of work when you've accidentally broken it this week or how you retrieve the version of your software that you use to produce the results in a journal paper that you published last year. If someone then comes to you and says, well, you know, this is really nuts, but what happens if you rerun this method using a different data set or something like that? And maybe you've done a whole year's worth of development since then, or, or you um, mutated the code into something else completely. And version control software also helps in collaboration with other people. Um, it allows you to be sure that if you're you've got more than one of you working on the same code base, that you do in fact both have the same version, or all of you have the same version of code, enables you to, to, to merge any changes and manage them and share changes that, that maybe more than one person will make. And that facility can be very useful even if you're the only person working on the code, because you can have, you may be using multiple computers, so you've got a laptop in your, your lap, and then you've got a, a fast machine, a big fast machine to do big experiments on. Um, you can share code between those. A popular version of control software includes Git, Mercurial, and Subversion. Many of you will be familiar with one or more of those in the Eastern concept, I expect. We're going to be using Mercurial in this, um, in this uh, example. Now, all of this is kind of leading towards this sort of big, awkward question about research software, which is, how do you know that your results actually come from the method that you described in the paper and are not simply artifacts of bugs in your code? Now, It's, this is the sort of question that, you can, that can give you a slightly paranoid air once you start thinking about it. If you, if you, next time you're asked to review a paper, for example, ask yourself, 
does the author actually make any effort to convince me that the code is right, as opposed to the method making sense in the real world? Um, and when you start thinking like that, you, it becomes quite difficult to, um, to well, I, I guess, essentially, I mean, I'm, I've published loads of code in the past that has failed this test, and I now feel pretty nervous about some of that code. So, you know, I'm trying to improve my own practice as well. There are two ideas here that are, that are relevant, which are validation and verification, which are aspects of the evaluation of research work. Validation is what you do, what you're typically expected to do in a published paper. It's having a look at your model, it's having a look at the results produced by your model and seeing how well they appear to reflect reality. So does your model actually capture um, the, the, the aspect of reality that you're trying to capture? And this is obviously something that you're expected to do in research work, normally. Verification is the other aspect, which is establishing that your code actually influences your model at all. This is something that, as programmers generally don't do this in a very formal manner anywhere, but most sort of good informal good practice in software development aims to get closer to having some sort of reassurance that your code actually does influence your model. But it's not something that you ever normally see in research publications. Generally, when you're writing software, you have this sort of notion of a, um, a feedback cycle where you write the code, you do something, or something happens, which enables you to find out what's wrong with it. Then you change it or fix it, and then you go around again. And um, some examples, I mean, obviously, if you publish code and somebody else uses it and gives you feedback about it, that's an obvious example of a feedback loop in software. Or, but obviously, that only works if you actually publish the code. Or you can imagine in an academic environment, might have the expectation that maybe peer review would provide you some sort of feedback. But, but again, that doesn't generally happen for the software itself. Uh, and one, one thing that we do do is run the code, run the experiment, say, have a look at the results and see whether they seem to make sense. But then you have, again, the problem of how you know whether the results you're seeing are really the outcome of your method or, or whether they're in fact just, just accidental results, essentially, that come from in the code. I mean, they're not, maybe this has not become such a hot topic in this field because we don't see it as a question of life and death necessarily, but there are some interesting examples from other fields like um, uh, Jeffrey Chang, I think, in bio, bioinformatics research, who was forced to retract about seven years' worth of work after it turned out that uh, the main source of novelty in his novel methods over that seven year period was a bug in his software. That's the sort of, seven, you know, you don't want a seven year long feedback loop that tells you that seven years ago you got it wrong. Um, so a lot, of this, a lot of what we do in software development practice is trying to shorten this feedback loop so that you can find out in two minutes instead of two years or whatever um, when something doesn't work. So what we're going to do... Can I ask a question? Yes. So in the two slides back, and Yeah. As in, as in measuring, making, certain, making sure that you're measuring what you need to measure and making sure that what you measure is actually an adequate, an adequate uh, model of your Yes, that sounds like a good um, So my understanding is that papers would really do this uh, in the same machine learning, for example, presenting figures on, uh, based on cost validation and things like this. This is slightly different from what is with you know, software Yes. Uh, well, I suppose that there's a there's a spectrum, isn't there, <laughs> of what you're actually um, validating. But at this point, I'm meaning to just to say that what we don't generally include when when writing about the evaluation of our work, we don't generally include testing for software bugs. That's all I'm really saying. So the example that I'm going to go through just now is a very simple piece of audio analysis. It's actually going to be the most, most straightforward, trivial tempo estimator mm -hmm. um, using Python. And um, because it's straightforward to write and read. Um, and using NumPy, which is the, the Python numerical module toolkit, and a unit testing framework called Knows, 
Um, and also using version control using uh, Mercurial and the easy Mercurial version control user interface. Um, <coughs> now, although although this is supposed to, although this is going to be entirely in Python, this there's nothing specifically um, specific to the to the framework or platform about any of this really. The, the, there are examples, for example, in your handout, there's a, a piece about version, uh, unit testing in C++ as well. So. <coughs> okay. um, does anyone know whether the network is working? At the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, Sorry? Okay, so we provided, we've made this, um, uh, this project on our code hosting site. <coughs> um, and it's got a, a version control repository in it, which has a number of files in it. And I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start if the network will commit by making a copy of this on my local machine. Um, so I, I start up using Mercurial, it's asking me what I would like to open. This is the URL of the uh, repository that was just on that page we just saw. And I'm going to bring it into a directory called Tempo in the machine. Okay, it worked. So we can see looking at this, <coughs> if I zoom in a lot, that we have a, a series, a small set of changes that, that I've made to this repository in the past before we published it. Uh, and this corresponds to files in the file system. Um, I see these to the tempo directory. No one read this. Is, it, is the text big enough? Um, so what we have in here is there are, there are several Python files and there's a subdirectory called test files and test files contains some, some web files with simple testing uh, data in them, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, the Python files in this directory are just useful helpers. If I open one of them in an editor, this is a, a little helper with um, functions that open a, a WAV file and read the audio data from it. Um, and for each of these, there is an accompanying <coughs> um, file with a unit test or more than one unit test. So here we have uh, a unit test for the audio file reader, and this loads a very small test file that's included, which only has four samples in it. It reads that, it checks that the samples are what we expect. In this case, they're supposed to be one minus one, one minus one, but because it's 16 bit white file, the positive values are slightly approximate. Um, then there's some little signal processing functions, and again, unit tests. <coughs> now, we can run the unit tests in order to, to test that this, this code apparently works. And this is the sort of thing that you would do if someone has provided you with software that has unit tests with it. So if I run those tests, which runs the Python testing framework, if I run those tests on, on test audio file.py, it says, it takes a moment to byte compile the file, and then it says it ran the test, one test, and it worked. I can also run all the tests in the directory just by writing those tests. And this um, looks for every file that starts with the name of the word test, and for, looks for every function in that file that starts with the word test, and it runs those and checks that they return successfully. And that's all it does. Um, now, just to quickly look at what the functions are that we've included here in the test data, if I run the IPython, which is Python Interactive Console, um, I can import audio file as AF. So AF is just a short name that I'm giving you so that I can refer to audio file, the audio file module within this session. Um, audio file is just the audio file.py file, which I included in the repository. And I import it, and then I can have a look at, um, for example, af.read or if I hit tab, it expands this. AF.read all mono samples from file, read the file, test files, slash beatbox.lab. Now this is a, a file of a, somebody beatboxing briefly. <coughs> and um, if I call this function, it reads all the data from the file and it returns two things. It returns 
a, uh, an array of audio samples, and it returns the sample rate of the file. And I can check that the sample rate is reasonable, 22,050, and I can have a look at the samples, and we can see that that's an array. If I do this, we can see how many samples there are, length of samples. So this is um, what's in the... Um, what's in the, the directory to start with. We can also um, plot the results. So if I load the matplotlib.pyplot as pp, which is a, a plotting region, um, not load, import, uh, and then pp.plot samples, and then pp.show, then you can see that this is a plot of the wave file that we just read from the, uh, the beatbox audio. Okay, so what I'm going to do, or what we're going to do, is write a, a tempo estimator. So this, you can imagine that a tempo estimator might um, consist of you know, a program called something like estimate tempo.py, and you give it the name of the file, and it returns the tempo of the file estimated somehow. Now, as a main program, this is going to look something like you're going to have tempo equals estimate tempo of file, which is a function and give it the file name, which you got from somewhere, and then print tempo is tempo. Okay, where's the file name going to come from? It's in, in Python, if you want to get this from the command line so that you can run estimate tempo file name, then import, this is the kind of black magic way to do this in Python, file name equals sys.rgv1, which is just the way it works in Python, print s tempo of file name. Now, this program, obviously it doesn't do anything. We haven't written the tempo estimator. It's almost complete, though, because we're not going to write the tempo estimator in this file. It's going to be written as a separate file, and that's going to be a file called tempoestimator.py. So I'll import that at the top as EST, and then refer to it down here, est.estimatetempo file. Now, this program, although it doesn't actually do anything yet, this program is finished. We're not, unless I've made some mistake in, in writing it, which maybe we'll discover when we try and run it now, we're not actually going to do anything else to it. Um, if I try running it, um, uh, beatbox.wap. Okay, I try and run it. Python tells me no module named tempo estimator. That I simply haven't written it yet. But when I've written it, hopefully it's going to work. But we're not going to make any other changes to this file yet. So the first thing I'm going to do now is I'm going to get that file under version control. So I've got this new project, or this project based on an existing project. If I go to the My Work tab in Ethercurl, you can see that there are various files listed down here. Um, there's one that we're interested in, estimate tempo.py, and there are a whole load that we're not. Like this one with the twiddle at the end is one that was made by the editor as a backup file. And this one ending in .pyc is a file generated by the Python program when you first run it, and so on. We're not interested in tracking any of those in version control. So I select all of those and go to ignore files. And I want to ignore all files with these extensions, PYC or PY twiddle, because they're of no interest in version control. Okay? And when I told it to ignore something, it created a file, a new file called .hgignore, which just lists the things that the version control system is not interested in tracking. So that file I will now add to the repository and commit and say ignore um, .pyc and .py fiddle file. And commit. And you see in the history we've added that file. Now, the one that we were interested in tracking, I will add that. And this tells the version control system that this file is of interest to us. From now on, any changes I make to this, it's going to keep track of whenever I commit something. So I added it, now I commit, saying um, start, or in fact write, tempo estimator main program. Okay. <coughs> now the very next thing I'm going to do, obviously we need to write a tempo estimator, that's the idea. But the very next thing I'm going to do is write a test. So I go back to my editor and open test tempo estimator.py. And this is going to test the, the 
module that we haven't written yet called tempo estimator.py. So we'll import that tempo estimator as EST. Now, let me divide this in two. Up here, I'll open tempo estimator.py. So at the top, we've got the code that's going to do the tempo estimation. At the bottom, bottom we've got the code that's going to test it. Now, a tempo estimator, what does it look like? It's going to be a function. We know that we're going to call it estimate tempo of file, and that will take the file name, and we can document it um, given the name of a file file, return the estimated tempo in bigger. Well, what's it expected to do? Now, we know that a tempo estimator is something that takes a file name or some audio data and returns a single number, which is the estimated tempo of that file. Now, there's a in the test files directory, there's a, a file called 120bpm.wav. Now, that just contains a single um, sample impulse every half a second. So it's exactly 120 beats per minute. All we're going to do for the top-level test of this is to load that file, estimate a tempo, and assert that the tempo is somewhere close to 120 beats per minute. Now, what we're not trying to do and this is quite an important point. What we're not trying to do is test in this test whether it's a good tempo estimator or whether it works for any kind of real-world material at all. All we're interested in is the absolute minimum baseline that would be considered acceptable to call it a tempo estimator, a valid tempo estimator, and to establish that it runs without breaking. So this test we'll call test tempo 120 beats per minute. And this will say tempo equals estimate tempo of file, test file slash 120bpm.wav, and then we assert that the tempo is close to 120 beats per minute, which in this case is going to mean ABS, the absolute value of tempo minus 120.0, is less than, say, half a beat per minute. That's the point in writing a test where you have to think, what exactly, what do I consider good enough to to, to, to call this a valid piece of code. And in this case, I'm going to consider that. <coughs> so, and at this point, I haven't written this yet. I'm just going to return zero. We know that zero is not a good result, but it allows me to run the test and see what happens. So if I run those tests on um, test tempo estimator.py, Okay, it fails because it says global name and estimate tempo of file is not defined. Now, this means that, not that my test is failing, but that I simply wrote the test wrong. So, go back to this, and I imported the tempo estimator, but I didn't refer to it correctly down here. So, est.estimate tempo of file. Now, I'll run it, and here we have the test fails with an assertion error. This means that the test has, I've written my test correctly, but it didn't work. And that's because the tempo return was wrong. Fine. Let me go and commit this. So I've got a unit test. Add, um, so right, top level tempo estimator test, and estimator stub. Stub being a function that doesn't do anything yet. Yeah. Uh, cool. Anyone got any, que any questions so far? Yes. I just have a question about the choice to use Mercury. Yep. But uh, the only reason I've even heard of it is because you need it to collaborate with anything on Google code. But what's, I mean, why do you guys use it? I don't really know anything about it, and that's sort of distributed like it. Yeah. It's, um, it's just very nice to use. <laughs> what? It's just very nice to use. Okay. Uh, it's simple, straightforward and distributed. <laughs> um, I'm hoping to talk a bit more, a bit later on, about the differences between the different version control systems, so perhaps this might come up again then. Yes? So what does exactly nodes do? Uh, does it run all the functions sequentially? It what it does is it takes either the file name you gave it, or all the files called test something or something test in the current directory. And it looks in those files for functions that have names like this. So they start with test, they have to start or they end with test. 
and it'll run each of those functions. And if the function doesn't fail an assertion, if it, or basically if it doesn't crash out, it'll return success. So all nodes will do when you run it is it either prints out an error if your test fails, or if all your tests succeed, it just prints out the number of tests it ran and the fact that they succeeded. You don't get any extra information there. The, idea, the whole idea is that you should be able to run your tests very quickly and get basically nothing at all if they work, because you really, all you really want is for it to be very obvious when any of them fail. So it only runs the functions that start new tests? Yes, that's right. It'll load a mod, the module, it'll load any file that starts with test and it'll run any functions called test. Okay, so now the tempo estimator, what's the function itself going to actually consist of? Well, I reckon that estimate tempo file is going to be a bit of a, uh, a simple function because all it's going to do is load the file, af.load. Now, af is going to be my uh, import audio file, the audio file of code that is in this directory already. Um, now, what is, what is the function I want to call called? Called read all mono samples from file. It's a nice short function. Then. Read all mono samples from file, from file name. And then we'll return estimate tempo of samples. Samples and sample rate. <coughs> okay, and that just means now we have another problem. Given some audio samples and their sample rate, return estimated tempo in BPM. Yeah, nice yep. Yeah. 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 You, well, in most cases, if you're running unit tests, you probably want to be running them at the level at which you do know what answers you expect. So in this case, our top level unit test, it, all it's really doing is checking that the tempo estimator runs um, and doesn't blow up. And if we know, for example, if you knew that feeding something null, empty data, silence, should always produce a predictable result then that would be a good example of something you could test. And then you could test that if you fed it something that wasn't silence, you got something else out. So you, you're doing the basic bare minimum at that top level. Where it's most, where the technique is most useful is at lower level function, where you do. And what's, and what's the, uh, okay, I'm examples out of here, but what's the advantage of using this unit test method of say, like uh, design as opposed to just like adding assertions throughout the Uh, partly because it allows you to think about the inputs and outputs of the, of the code in terms independently of how the code works. If you th in a way, you can think of writing the unit tests as a sort of exercise for yourself and whether you really understand the problem. Um, if you don't know what out for a, for a low-level function, if you don't know what output you expect for a certain input, then you know, maybe you need to think about the problem more, I suppose. <laughs> so it's a, it's, it's a question of rearranging the problem rather than... Um, okay, so this, this function which estimates the tempo of, a, uh, uh, of some samples. And the, the, the very simple tempo estimator that we're going to be doing is, um, is just going to be chop up the audio file into frames, non-overlapping frames of a certain length. Um, do something to each frame. Um, I mean, there could be overlapping frames. Perhaps the same code would work out. But do something that gets us a function at equally spaced intervals throughout the file, and then apply an autocorrelation to that function and find some peak in the autocorrelation and get the, um, the, the, like, the likely beat interval that corresponds to that autocorrelation and get the tempo back out. So at a sort of high level, this function then is going to go, we're going to get something which we'll call our detection function, <coughs> or df for short, and um, and that is going to be calculated uh, function be calculated from these samples, 
And then we'll do something to that, um, some autocorrelation function, which gets us um, autocorrelation of that. Let's not worry too much about these details yet. The point is they're going to be filled in. Um, and then um, tempo will be, again, something else that we haven't written yet. Find tempo from autocorrelation of ACF, and we return tempo. All right. And again, we don't expect this to actually pass any tests. Detection function is not defined, is what it says. So we haven't, we haven't written the detection function. It's obviously not going to work. Nonetheless, I'm going to commit it anyway. Um, sketch implementation of um, tempo estimation. So now dropping down to a lower level, of course, the, the detection function is going to be um, something based on chopping up the audio file into uh, the frames of a certain fixed length. Now, if I go back to my IPython console, you can see that I've got these samples which I loaded from the Vbox audio file, and we can see the number of samples. Now, if we say that we're going to chop it up into samples of length, um, sorry, into frames of length, I don't know, 512, because it's a nice computer -y kind of length. Um, then what, we, what we're going to need to do is have a function that chops it up. Now, this is obviously a very basic thing to, to write. Um, but there are two things, two aspects to it. One is how many frames do you expect to get. The other is what's in each frame. So if we've got, say, 512 sample frame, then the number of frames we might expect to get number of samples divided by 512. Now that's an integer division, which is what Python does by default if you give it integers. If we give it a floating point number for the second one, then we get something more precise. We get 495.9 something frames. Now, presumably, the last one of those, which is only 0.9 frames worth of samples, we want to include that one. We don't want to just execute it. So in fact, what we want is 496 frames. So the actual expression for the number of frames we're going to get will be something like um, the ceiling of the number of um, samples. Now, ceiling is not defined because it's part of the NumPy um, mathematical um, numerical module. So I refer to it as np.ceiling, having imported the NumPy module. OK, so that expression is going to give us the number of frames we expect to get from an audio file given length. Then what is each frame? Well, if you have the first, the first frame is going to be from the first sample up to the 512th sample and so on. And in Python terms, that means the first sample it can be expressed as samples square brackets zero, because Python starts counting array indexes at zero, like most other programming languages, but unlike MATLAB, and up to 512, but not including 512. Mathematically, you probably ought to written like that, but it's not. Um, and that's the first frame. We can check that it has the right length, 512 samples long. And similarly, the second frame would be from 512 to 1024. Okay, so having sort of worked out in the interactive console how that's going to work, we can start writing, we've got, we're going to be writing framer.py, which chops something up into frames. And again, I emphasize that this is a deliberately a very simple example. And test framer dot py, which checks the, our results of what we expect. Now, test framer is obviously going to start by import framer, as you can. And in the framer, we're going to have functions, two functions, one which gets us the number of frames and one which gets us a frame. So def get frame count, given the number of samples, and the hop, that is the length from one frame to the next, given the number of Samples return the number of frames, non-overlapping frames, of length hop we can extract from. For the moment, I'll return zero. And get frame. And then given some samples and a particular hop and a number, So we return the nth frame here. And 
I'm going to return an empty NumPy array. So the whole idea here is that in each case, I'm returning something which is guaranteed to be wrong in almost every case, just so that I can now write the tests and check that I wrote the test correctly, go back and write the code. So to test the get frame count function, the first thing we can try, we've got an example right in front of us. We're fairly confident that if you have If you have 253,929 samples and a frame length of 512, you should get 496 frames back. So we can use that as an example. If you've got some simple to express real world data in front of you, there's no harm in making use of it. So let's assert that get frame count of and paste these in 496. But on the whole, by and large, you don't write unit tests using real-world data. You write unit tests using data that's small enough and simple enough that you can actually reason about the expected results yourself. So, can someone give me an example? How many frames and what frame size and how many frames, sorry, how many samples, what frame size, how many would you expect? Zero. Zero samples? What, what frame size? Uh, 59. 59? Doesn't really have to be 59, it could be one. <laughs> Um, how many frames do you expect? Zero. Zero. Okay. Another one? Anyone else? Okay. How about um, four samples, frame size two, what do you expect? Two? Five and two, how many do you expect? Okay. And maybe let's have one in which the frame size is one. So this is you know, pretty soon you start going up the top. This is at the absolute maximum you'd consider writing for a unit test for that function. It's you know, pretty simple function. Um, so get frame. Now we can imagine using some of the same, applying some of the same tests here, um, but with actual audio data. Now, first one, well, there aren't supposed to be any frames if you've got empty um, input, so we can't really test that here. But for the second one, if we pass in an array with four items, one, two, three, four, and our frame size of two, then maybe take the first frame, we expect the answer to be an array with one and two in it. Agreed? Um, and these are NumPy arrays, that's how you make one. One, two, three, four, five and frame size 2, and then the interesting one here is the third frame, the one with the 5 in it, which is frame number 2 in Python terms, and we expect that to be what? Five and something? Just five, or five and something? I'm, I'm going to reckon that five and zero is probably the most useful thing for our frame to return there, so that all frames are known to be the same size. But that, again, it depends on what your code is for. Um, and get maybe the element three from here. And that should be, let's see, naught, one, two, three, that should be four. You have to choose the get frame all the counts. Thank you. <coughs> and I'll tell you what else. I've imported the framework, but I haven't referred to the module that I imported, so all of these need to have fr dot at the start. Now, is this going to work? What do you think? Um, Okay, so first problem I get is that NP is not defined, so I haven't imported NumPy. Um, next small problem, um, 
you mentioned a moment ago, we haven't put brackets around these arrays. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now up here, this is an interesting one. We got the wrong result there. Did I just type it in wrong? Or get frame? Ah, of course, we haven't actually written it yet. Sorry. Um, so, okay, all of our assertions are failing. That's, that's good. That means we haven't, you know, we, our, our tests are working, but we haven't written the function yet. Now here, up here, we know that the frame count, we had an expression for that in our um, uh, console, and it is this. So let's use that. Where this is the hop as a floating point number. And then frame... N is going to be return samples um, from N times hop to N plus 1 times hop. Right? Length of N samples. Oh, yes, thank you. Because we passed in the number, not the array. Okay, that probably should work. All right, now this error is more interesting one, which somebody over there alluded to a moment ago. It's failing at line 13, which is um, this line here in my test, because I'm testing to see whether I, the array returned by my framework is the same as the array that I expected. Now, the problem with this is that NumPy is too clever for us. A NumPy array um, is quite is, is handled as quite a sophisticated object in NumPy. It's not like a say a vector in Java. Um, it's more like a mathematical notion of a vector matrix. Um, so say we have an array with one, two, three in it, and then we have another array with um, one, two, five in it, um, A and B. Then if you do A plus B, you get an array that consists of the individual elements of pairwise added. If you do a times b, you get, again, the same thing multiplied together. If you do a to the power of 2, you get each element squared, which is really nice. But if you do is a equal to b, then you don't just get true or false. You might expect to get false because these two arrays are not the same. What you actually get is the result of comparing each element in the array. So in order to find out whether the two are actually um, different, you need to do this, check whether every element is true, and the answer is no. Similarly, you might check whether any element is true, and that is true, but that's not what we're after. So here we have to do, and this is rather annoying, but it's a consequence of um, NumPy's being, in this case, a bit too clever for our own good, um, do this. OK, run it again. Right, so here you can see it's failed at line 14. There's uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. There's five elements, and we're checking the last element, or the last frame, and we expect it 5 and 0. And it doesn't work because in our implementation, we just naively returned an array subset, and that is, <coughs> there's nothing in there. We can print the results. Um, there's nothing in there to do the zero padding at the end. So we print the results. We can see we've got, for the first test, we had one and two, which is uh, the output for this, which is good. And then the next live output just says five, and that's supposed to be five and zero. Now, this is an incredibly trivial example, of course. But this is kind of the nub of the whole question, in that the, the point here is that you Sat down, you sit down and naively write something, and it kind of works. But it's only because a unit testing regime gives you the opportunity to stop and think about what the tricky cases are as a deliberate mental exercise before you write the code. That, um, and I say a unit testing regime, this is actually a test-driven development regime in which you write the test before you write the code. Um, but it's only because of that opportunity to stop and think about what the difficult cases are going to be first that you end up ever actually noticing that, the, that your code is not right. And in this case, obviously it's simple enough that probably you would notice it at the outset of 
But in reality, most code isn't like that. I mean, the, the reality of it is that almost every time I write a unit test for some of my code, I discover that some, something in it was wrong. Um, maybe I'm just a bad programmer. Um, so we need to zero pad it. So if length of frame is less than hop, then frame equals, and there might maybe a simpler way to do this on um, um, If you've got zeros, hop minus then frame. Does that look right? Let's test it. Okay, now the test pass. And we commit test and implement framework. All right, now going back to the tempo estimator. Again, uh, the implementation at the top and the test at the bottom. Um, we know that we still haven't written the detection function, and if I try and test my tempo estimator, nose tests will remind us that the detection function is not defined. So what's it going to be? Um, now, we don't just want the samples, we also want the hop size. So let's pass that in, and for the moment, let's just make it hop over. Um, return a function that, um, what does it do? Um, corresponding to the interest level in some way of the samples at intervals of the hop size. And again, start by returning something that can't possibly work just so that we can write a test. Now, testing the detection function. Again, this is a very a relatively high-level function. You're pretty much either you've got something quite specific that you expect to get out, or you're going to be making assertions that um, correspond to general truths about detection functions at large. Um, so, for example, um, and I'm not going to go into this in as much detail as the uh, previous one, but so for example, if we have data of sample equals np dot array of um, uh, one zero 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 one zero zero zero, uh, and we're going to have a frame size of two. Then sample from two. Then we're going to get back five values in our detection function. So the very first thing we want to check is just that the detection function returns five um, values. Um, <coughs> and then we don't yet know what sort of detection function we're going to have. And quite likely, this is going to change at some point in the future as you go through more sophisticated explorations into how tempo estimation might work. Um, but all we really need to know is that the value is expected to be higher at points where something more interesting is happening, and lower at points where something is not happening. Um, and so, you can encode this kind of thing as we assert that, for example, this frame, which is frame three, because you're counting from zero, is more interesting than this frame, frame two. So we assert that df of three is greater than df of two. Similarly, I'm going to assert that df of df0, the very first frame, is more interesting than df2. I'm not going to assert that this frame is more interesting than this one, because although something has started happening here, something has actually stopped happening here, and in some cases, the real-world detection function you use might be symmetric. It might be, might record interest when something stops as well as when something starts. So this is just the very basics. Okay, and Again, rather pointlessly, perhaps. Okay, I haven't imported NumPy somewhere. Um, rather pointlessly, I can run the tests, but we know it's not going to work. Um, uh, import 
say pop. And <coughs> uh, autocorrelation is not defined, detection function is not defined. Detection function should be defined within that module. You've got to refer to it. Okay, so now autocorrelation is not defined, so my tempo estimator can't work still, but the um, detection function test runs and it shows us that we're failing to return five elements. We know that. So the all the detection function is going to do is it's going to chop up the um, chop up the samples into frames of that hot size, um, and it's going to for each one for, for the purposes of this example we're just calculate going to calculate the time domain RMS value, um, some level indication. So the number of frames um, is uh, our, oh we need to import our frame map. Uh, as fr. fr.get frame count from sample and hop. Uh -huh. Sorry, from the number of sample and the hop. And then we're going to do something for each frame in range 0 to n frames. And what we'll do for that frame is we'll get the frame data itself. Um, and calculate its RMS. Now, RMS happens to be something that it is included in this directory already, import signal processing. So there's a signal processing dot py, and one of the things in it is RMS as sp. And then we need to stick that value into an array that we're going to return. So let's make an array. Um, frames worth of zeros and the f of n is value and turn dx. And now we run the tests, and it's, the tempo estimate still fails because we haven't written auto, but we haven't defined autocorrelation, um, or at least we don't know where we're getting the autocorrelation from. But the detection function test works. We've actually now run that unit test, and each of those assertions has succeeded. And we know that the unit test was being run because when we first implemented the function, we did it in such a way as to fail, guaranteed. And that's a pretty good way of making sure because a lot of the time you write tests, you run, they pass, and you don't realize that the tests are not actually being run because you forgot to put test on the score at the start or something like that. So it's always good practice to write your code in such a way as to fail the test the first time around so that you can be sure that the tests are really being run. Now, I'll commit that. Implement. Uh, and test detection function. Uh, okay, next problem we had was that autocorrelation is not defined. Now, the reason autocorrelation is not defined is because actually it's in the same SP file, signal processing file, as the RMS was. So um, that's easy enough, and there's a test written there. Now, find tempo from autocorrelation. Not defined. Okay. Um, def find tempo from correlation. Um, now, in order to conserve time, I'm not going to write a unit test for this one. I'm going to leave that as an exercise for the reader, but actually it's a very good exercise. Um, because an autocorrelation function is going to have some peaks at intervals of likely repeated beats, you can very easily construct a synthetic autocorrelation function that will correspond to a particular tempo. And it should be no, matter than, no more than a few um, values in the array to get it out. So find tempo from autocorrelation, let's say, for the moment, because this is just an, ex just a, an exercise I'm just going to Try and fill in the details from uh, okay. So we need to know that we want the tempo between certain minimum and maximum BPM values. Um, which I will hard code as 
there is a function again in signal processing that converts BPM values to autocorrelation lag, so distance into the autocorrelation array. So um, lag min equals sp dot BPM to lag of BPM max, because a higher BPM is a shorter spacing. Lag max equals BPM to lag of BPM min. Um, we get a subset of the autocorrelation now. Um, covering that range, we find the peak, which will be um, uh, and then a numpy function to find the peak, numpy on max. We see a subset lag peak equals mean x. Um, BPM, uh, lag to BPM all, lag peak. Okay, so that's just filling in a bit of magic, essentially. I think, will that work? No, it won't work, because in this thing we have a BPM to lag and lag to BPM functions, and they take not only the BPM of the lag, but also a hot per second value, which we need to provide somehow. Oops, where's my name? So passing that in. And here, hops per sec equals sample rate divided by the front of the hop size. And that, OK, won't work because I didn't refer to it in the SP module here. Okay, so now having filled in that final function, I run the tests for the tempo estimator again, and in a very quiet result, it just tells me that it ran two tests and they work. If I run those tests without any arguments, it will now test everything in the directory, run eight tests, and they all succeeded. So we know now that what we've got out passed not only all the tests for the individual components building up, but also the top level test in which it loaded a 120 BPM file, estimated the tempo, and came out with something close to 120. So we are now confident that what we've built here is some form of tempo estimator. Um, maybe not a good one, but we can try it out. Now that we've got these modules, um, we can try it out in uh, the interactive console. So um, say I import tempo estimator as EST and then run, maybe I could get a detection function of, um, of sample this about 512 pop. Um, I can plot the detection function. That's the detection function from our beatbox file. I can call um, estimate tempo oops, of samples from the samples that I oops, um, from the samples that I loaded from the file. And if I can't remember how that function works, I can't remember how to call it, I can ask Python and or ask the interactive Python console by putting some question marks at the end. And that gives me the not only the documentation, but in this case the source code. If I only gave one question mark, it would give me the documentation which I wrote when I was writing the function. So I've got, by building it up in this way and writing little bits of documentation as I go, and writing functions that are small enough to do a single, easily understood function at a time, I've got something that I can then use interactively and I can interrogate these functions in the interactive console um, and um, make the whole thing just easier to, easier to use. It's also going to make things easier to swap things in and out. So, um, Okay, tempo, so let's, let's give it a go. Um, samples and sample rate, these are the things that were loaded earlier from the box file. And the tempo is 80.7 beats per minute. Now, is that right or wrong? That's where you start getting back into the question, obviously, of, of um, validation of whether your tempo estimator actually reflects the real world. In this case, 
I believe that's roughly right. But that's not, that's outside the scope of uh, software testing back in the realm of um, research method testing. And so having um, committed this last bit of work, the next thing I'm going to do is I've got a new function, uh, sorry, a new project here on the sound software code side um, called Lisman 2012 Tutorial Output. And for anyone who's interested in looking at this, it's got an empty repository at the moment. I'm going to just grab the URL of that repository from there and uh, set push and pull location in easy Mercurial. And I'm going to push the entire repository with its history into that project. If the network is working. Okay. So back in the browser, I reload this page on the, this is on code.soundsoftware.ac.uk and we'll make this available, in fact it is now available, but we'll make the URL available on our website, other side of it. This contains all the work that we just did in this example. Okay, and it's 10 to Four, which means coffee break. But has anyone got any questions? We can come back to and review this again after coffee, if you like. Um, but in the meantime, any questions? Have you got any questions? Mm -hmm. uh, so instead of sometimes having to implement the unit tests for results that we are really not sure, about, we have to create synthetic inputs and then kind of do the math or the, the, yeah. the expected output so we can put the assertion. Is there a way to actually, for instance, people can use MATLAB and it's assuming that MATLAB is validated and code is right, um, so that if you are in Python or in C++ or in Java, whatever language you use the problem, to somehow send exactly the same data that you are getting in your code to another software package part of the or something, and then for oh. Google mode, and, and somehow retrieve all of the all that So if, it's some, if for some part of your code you're implementing something that already exists in a MATLAB toolbox, say, mm -hmm. uh, and you'd like an automated way of running your code and running up the MATLAB toolbox and checking the results. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not something I've ever done. It's presumably possible you could script it by having something like a shell script that runs up MATLAB and gets the results out. Um, it has one problem, which is that anybody else who gets it might not be able to run the tests as well, because they might not have MATLAB. And I suppose one, this is one thing that I perhaps should stress about this sort of work here, is that we now have, obviously, okay, let me ignore those um, backup files and so on, but in this direction we now have uh, a load of little Python files, each of which is one self-contained module, or depending only on other modules that it needs to depend on. Um, and each of them has a set of unit tests which you can run. And anybody receiving this code can easily see which bit of code lies where. They can, looking at something like this, they can easily see what the functions in this are supposed to do. And they can look at the unit tests to see how you would call it in typical examples. They can run the unit tests to check that it works. They can see whether they, in fact, tr trust that the unit tests have actually tested enough. Um, and so writing it this way hasn't just, I suppose, given us, um, uh, given us more tested code, but, you know, tested code is better code as well. It's easier to read and it's easier to reuse. So, yes, it would, it, 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 it could be a very good idea, perhaps for more complex methods that you know someone's already implemented, to check your code automatically against those if you can. But you don't necessarily want to rely on the other implementation being right either, especially if it is something that you can reason about as well. Shall we go and get some coffee? Coffee is downstairs. So. <laughs>